All right, Dallas versus Pittsburgh, Game 7, October 22nd. So, in the previous video, as usual, we ended with our predictions. Quinn, you said 2-1 stars or 2-1 pins. I said 3 nothing stars or pins 4-1 to one if they were going to turn things around. We didn't hit on those, but I feel as if I won that prediction because it was more close to how I predicted. A little more of a blowout if the stars were going to win that. So, uh, right from the get-go of the game, the, the Pittsburgh Penguins came out and they just jumped all over Dallas. I think within the first like five minutes, the shots were 8-2, and they were just overwhelming our defense, overwhelming our our goalie with just shots. And then Pittsburgh was actually handling the puck actually very well inside of our zone. I uh, I thought from from the start of the game, it felt like it was going to be a very different game. Oh, yeah. I, I felt like Pittsburgh was just going to come out. You know, like I said in the last episode, that they have something to prove against Dallas. So they definitely came out with the spark. Yeah, and going in and watching some of the post-game interviews and stuff like that, especially from the Pittsburgh Penguins coach, he, going back to what I said about how the, the Penguins were really you know moving the puck very well but i did notice uh i did notice something that the coach actually pointed out on is that the penguins were actually being too cute with the puck you saw uh in one instance is that they do a drop pass and then another drop pass and then try to do the cycle instead of having you know you do one drop pass crash the net put it on and see what goes from there it, it did seem like with all of the pressure that the Penguins were sustaining in the Dallas zone, they did start getting too cute and a little too big for their britches. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Uh, Pittsburgh's more one of those uh, skilled uh, uh, opponents that can do that, but when you're playing against a team like Dallas, it's not always going to work. I think I, I honestly think that Pittsburgh didn't really learn their lesson from the first game because they took Dallas's defense for light lightly you know they when they were in the zone sustain, sustaining all that pressure they it it just seemed like they didn't think Dallas had any kind of defensive game and whenever Dallas started pushing back Pittsburgh didn't have an answer they started turning the pucks over. They they were letting Dallas take the game to them instead of sustaining all of that pressure that they had built up and all that momentum that they had built up. Especially, I think Dallas had that huge momentum going in towards the middle of the first period with Niemi's like, stellar play from the get-go. Just right from the jump, Niemi was fantastic, as usual, as he does against Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, I was actually kind of scared there for a little bit that uh, he's, he's getting too overworked in the first, first period. I, I was actually... Shots. Yeah, I was, uh, I was actually quite worried, too, that um, Pittsburgh was finding a weakness in Dallas's game. And that was just over sustained pressure and just a ton of shots on. But again, ah, bad pass. But again, couldn't convert on anything that was uh, that was presented to them. Especially going on that uh, with Dallas going on that late uh, power or that not late power play, but that power play that uh, Malkin had that shorthanded breakaway. If if you want the NFL does a show called Turning Point. If you want to know what the turning point is for this game, it was that. It was Niemi's just excellent glove save on Malkin right there in the first period on the breakaway. 
Uh, let's see. Harping on what we've talked about in past videos, let's let's just go right into it. Nachushkin actually looked a lot better in this game. Now, yeah, he looked he looked like he had he was back to his form. Yeah, people might say you know you know we're we're too hard on him, but you know what? He's he's now he he's a professional athlete in the NHL. Whoa, look at that. Whoa, how's it getting waved That's off? That's going to be a high stick. That's going to be a high stick right there. You know, people have said that, you know, with some criticism that you could be too hard on him, that, you know, it's still a, he missed a lot of last season. And granted, it, it was just the effort that wasn't being put in from his game. And it seemed like he actually found another gear and... Wow, it got called off. It got uh he found another gear and really decided to play in this game, which was great. I loved seeing Nachushkin coming out and actually, you know, playing. It, it it seemed like he was he was very deserving of his ice time, which was which was nice because a lot of the times it just felt like, you know, he's He's given this ice time because of who he is, because of the high tout that he had, because he's a high draft pick. So he earned his ice time in this game, and it was refreshing to see. Another Especially thing, playing on a line with uh, Yanmark, I think that kind of gave him some some motivation. To see, see him playing with an, uh, another rookie that's fighting to stay on the the roster, you know, right. that's outplaying him. Oh, and again, we talk about um, we can we can go in and start talking about the rookies in this game. Another strong outing from the rookies, um, especially from I, I really liked uh, Yanmark and Fosca in this game, especially with Fosca. He was really able to come in and. He, he seems to have found a little grit in his game, which I really liked. He, on the face-offs, he was out there for key face-offs against key people like Crosby and, you know, some other of their, their uh, center ice men. I've been, I've been noticing that with, uh, with the lines that Ruff has been putting out. Uh, it seems like a lot of the time, like, our fourth line is taking those big face-offs against the big key players like, like last game with Giroux. And this game with Crosby, Malkin. All, oh yeah, all of um, the, uh, the you big could players. You could hear Razor talk about that, about how Ruff has found that confidence in our bottom six to really come out and put pressure on uh, an opposing team's top six, especially with I really like that combination of Fosca, Sevier, and Fiddler. Oh. You know, if, if Fosca gets kicked out, and we saw late in the game when Fosca got kicked out of that, um, out of the out of the faceoff circle, Fiddler came right in and won that faceoff. It, it it was nice to see that you have that whole line filled with center icemen that are so versatile that can play wing for you when you need them to. I I really liked that. Um, Yanmark stood out. His speed, um, his his skill with the puck. His vision, it just seems to be getting a lot better. Him, on, especially on his goal, he crashed the net just like a successful uh, scoring winger would do in the NHL, and that was great to see. Now, what did you, what did you see from the defensive side on Dallas's game? Um, well, we'll start out with... Uh... I looked up some stats and uh, locked shots. We definitely outnumbered Pittsburgh on that, which is a good sign that our defense aren't afraid to get into the shooting zone. They're willing to stop the puck so Niami doesn't have to. Right. You know, that's always refreshing to know. Yeah, I, I actually took a note of that in seeing that we had a ton of blocked shots. You know, defensemen were just ready to put their body on the line to make sure that there's no true like there's no rebounds there's there's not too much pressure on the emmy to overwhelm for pittsburgh to actually come in 
and really take it to Dallas. I, I really liked seeing our defensive side really... It, it kind of reminded me of a playoff game. When you think about it, like our defense just yeah. tried to stand in every single one of the shots, and it worked. Yeah, I think I think uh, I mentioned to you like even before the season started, it would it would be a it would be a really nice uh, playoff series, Stanley Cup series to see Dallas <sighs> and Pittsburgh. You know, that would make for a pretty good uh, series. Oh, I completely agree. Talking about Dallas and Pittsburgh. We can go back to the 2013-14 season. The past six games that Dallas has played against Pittsburgh, Dallas is now 5-1. and one. You want to talk about something that Dallas has? That's Pittsburgh's number. Um, it, and they some games have been close, but a lot of the games have been these types of high-scoring games to where Pittsburgh gets nothing against Dallas. Granted, I mean, Pittsburgh had more shots, but that that first period and like the last, and especially the last like five minutes of the third period when they had that six on three power play. I mean, we can talk about that in a little bit, but Dallas has really had their number. They've been able to apply the pressure where they needed to, and they've always got they've gotten good goaltending too from Pittsburgh which is great to see now going back again I also went and looked up Dallas is now 6 and 1 they have done this since moving to Dallas they've done this type of start 3 times uh in in their past seasons once in the 96-97 season once in the 2011 2012 season and one huge important season and that would be the 98 99 season yeah the stanley cup season does that have any kind of significance Mm, i don't know but it's good to see that in our Stanley Cup season, we started off 6-1 and one through the first seven games. Could be a sign. Could not be. You know, everything could fall apart from now on. I, I don't want to jinx anything. But, ooh, it, it, it feels good. Whenever I looked that up, it felt really good seeing that. So, that's a nice little fun stat about our 6-1 and one start. Ooh, nice save. Yeah. It's definitely refreshing from last season that we're getting these games at the beginning instead of letting them fall short, which inevitably hurts us in the end. We're always playing catch-up and comes down to that wild card spot. Yeah. Uh, what else What else did you notice? Did you notice anything else about the defensive side on the Stars game? Um, I, I kind of wanted to talk about the power play. I think it was the first power play whenever uh, Malkin got his, his breakaway. Uh-huh. It kind of seemed that Dallas was trying to focus too much on offense. Uh, granted, that is the, the mindset of a power play, but a lot of the times you need to be aware of your defense stepping Oof. in. Right. Um, yeah, you always have to have some sort of defensive mind whenever you're on the power play because... If you, especially with that breakaway, I believe they were trying to funnel things through the through the for, through the defense, and so you get one person that steps up and blocks a shot. Boom, they're on a breakaway. Yep, and it, it kind of seemed like it was at the end of the shift. So you see, sharp sharp's coming back, but he's kind of lackadaisical. It almost right. seems like he sees Malkin with the puck, and he's like, oh, well, I mean, it, the goalie gets it or he doesn't. There's, there was no real hustle to try and get back. Right. Yeah, no, especially at the end of that shift, you could definitely tell that they were gassed and that they were pretty much, I think, <laughs> I think a lot of the defense on that uh, play was they just probably put their hands up and said, Jesus, take the wheel. 
and said, I hope Nami comes and stops this puck, which I think Malkin was a little gassed too because when you look at that shot, he didn't really yeah, put a, he, no real zip on it. Yeah, he didn't really put a lot on it. So Niemi was able to, you know, flash the glove. It, it the it looked like a routine save, routine glove save, and and what Razor was saying last night is that there's a scouting report on Niemi that says he hangs his glove uh, a little bit. So I that's probably why. Malkin went glove side, but you know if I think if Malkin had put in like a little deek or you know not just a little wimpy shot that he did, he probably would have had a better chance. But granted, I'm thankful that that's the shot choice that he chose. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I guess let's talk about the officiating in the game so I have some real hot sports opinions on this subject this was probably one of the worst officiating games that I've seen in a long time there were so many there were so many blown calls against Pittsburgh and so many blown calls against Dallas like the two penalties that Fasca got on him, all they did, especially I'm say pretty much all penalties that were called on us were all bull. Right, well, especially maybe except for the the Dimmers one. That well, yeah, the Demers. Yeah, we'll talk. Going. We'll talk about. We'll talk about the Demers one in a minute. But every every uh, penalty that the Stars got, and you know what, you can call this me being a homer or anything like that. But if you go back and you look at those replays. All they do, especially like the the Latang one, all he did was just he Fosca does all he hits his stick, and then like five seconds later, Latang falls down on his own on his own. So Fosca initiates contact on all stick, and then Latang tries to tries to overstep and then kind of it looked like he kind of just lost an edge and just fell down it took you know it it was such a delayed reaction to him getting his stick hit that he probably fell down but i didn't agree with that call at all the the sharp penalty all he, he that was all shoulder all sharp did was come in and hit him you know uh Sharp got a penalty. He got two minutes for playing hockey. That's all it was. I I didn't agree with I didn't agree with the, I mean the fiddler one was a little iffy. I guess that could have gone either way, but the two Fosca penalties, the Sharp penalty, they were so not penalties like I, I didn't understand where the refs were getting off saying those were penalties I don't I don't even understand how Fithers was a penalty like you look at it he doesn't even really touch him and Perron goes flying into the boards yeah like he just so, loses an edge exactly that play especially is kind of like the Latang uh, shot Fiddler is skating down the puck Perron cuts him off and then just falls down. Fiddler doesn't even try to initiate contact with Perron. You know what? And another thing, I can't stand Perron. Him and his stupid tinted visor. He's one of those players that I just hate. Kind it's kind of like how the NHL has some fans that hate uh Brown or Perry. Perron is one of those players and it goes back to like his Edmonton days, his St. Louis days. I've never liked him. I think he's just one of those players that tries to. I don't. It's hard to. It, it, it's. I feel as if he's kind of a diver. He he just he just has that play style to him that I just didn't like. I just I, and I've never liked. But. Going into, oh Jesus, I'm gonna put that in my own net. Um, 
staying on the officiating of the game and talking about penalties, let's talk about the Demir's elbow. Now, go, watching post-game stuff, you can tell that Demir's was very sincere. He was like, I hope he's okay. Um, you know, I don't think he meant to, th- you know, throw his elbow into Benino's face the way he did. His explanation... No, I think it was just at all a case of losing your foot when you're trying to throw that reverse hit. Yeah. And... He, he was saying that... I, I, it looked like Benino held up a bit because I think Benino knew the reverse hit was coming. So, Demir's expected him to for Benino to come fully into him, into the boards. That way, he could throw the old Brendan Morrow on him and try to get that reversal off of him. I mean, it's a standard, it's a standard hockey play. But mm. Benino, Benino holds up a little bit. Demir's times it wrong. And throws the elbow into his face. Do you agree with the five-minute uh, penalty? No. It, it, I I feel it should have been. It could have been a four-minute, just a double minor. <laughs> but I don't think it warranted a five-minute in a game misconduct. I guess uh, a, a double. I would have been. I would have been happy with the double minor because of the apparent injury and I think it did draw blood from his mouth I think I there were reports saying that there was there was blood on the towel when the trainer was uh tending to him but you know what I thought it was I thought it was a fair penalty Benino looked all shaken up it was all his elbow was all face it's head contact the NHL is trying to cut down on that so I was like, okay, fine. That's the one thing that I agreed with about the officiating with the game. Um, especially with, uh, you saw, um, there was, there was, there's a couple of plays from Pittsburgh that how they went uncalled, like the Kunitz slash in Demir's face, uh, right before Demir's did the elbow. Um, Kunitz did it like a two-handed slash up in Demir's face. You had Crosby do a two-handed whack on Oduya's leg because he got hit and Crosby was getting frustrated. And then you have in a little scrum. I think it was. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It might have been Benino that gave some uh, some little rabbit punch. No, no, no. It was Dupree. Yeah, Dupree, Dupree to uh, what? What was it? Uh, Dimmers or somebody? Yeah, he got in like a couple no, of those. Goligoski. Yeah, he got in a couple of those little rabbit punches to the back of the head. That I'm like, how are these not being called? It it was ridiculous. But okay, enough. Enough about that. Oh. Um, let's talk about Oduya's first goal as a Dallas Star. The bearded Swede with the soft, silky hands. Oh, another goal that's being called. That's going to be goalie interference. The soft, silky mitts of the flutter shot that is a la Rookie of the Year. Um, during during the, the Reddit game thread... So one of the Pittsburgh uh, fans had posted from, I, I guess it's some Pittsburgh analyst or something like that that, you know, watches the game and stuff like that. That said, he says in the super slow mo uh, replay, he said it it got touched by a high stick. I didn't see it. I watched I watched all the slow mo cams that I could, and the way it was fluttering in. It looked like it it didn't get touched at all. It looked like the same consistent flutter was on the puck the whole time. But exactly. uh, how'd you how'd you uh, how'd you like that goal? Uh, it, it's definitely a good thing for him, kind of boost his confidence, uh, and just way to stick with the play. Yeah. That that made me happy that. He didn't. He just threw it to net. He knew his shift was coming up, 
everybody is still there trying to get that deflection form and it just goes straight in over the shoulder it looks like Flory didn't even see it yeah uh, post game interview they asked him about that shot he said that he kind of just lost it I, it looked like he just lost it in the sticks so that's why he didn't really react all that much to it going to the next goal the Klingberg goal the little twinkle toes that he pulled on Dupree at the uh, Dupree uh, no it was Dupree yeah Dupree um, the little twinkle toes that he pulled on him at the blue line was you know that that was his rookie year like in cliff notes right there just of how Klingberg was able to dance off the line last season to find ways to just put in a nice little wrister. I mean, it, it goes back to his last his last season that he was able to uh, put a shot on. In the post game, he Flurry got asked about that shot as well, and he said that he had just peeked over to the wrong over because Ben was right there in front of him providing a screen he said he looked right shot went left not much you could really do about that that that's that's pretty much where Ben is making all of his money at on the on the power play is nowadays is uh sitting in making that screen oh yeah absolutely I mean Ben's a big body he's he's strong there's no reason as to why Ben should not be that person in front of the net it if Ben, if Ben wasn't going to the front of the net the way he is, that would probably be in my game notes about a complaint about Ben. But credit to Ben, he knows he knows he's a big strong guy, and knows that he he needs to be the one to go to the front of the net. You know that's what that's what a captain should do. Um, let's talk about. The Pittsburgh goal with Jordy Ben's one Jordy Ben's like one mistake of the game. Him and Yoki Pake exchanged the puck behind the net. Ben instead of going up the boards like I would assume most defensemen should do in a circumstance like that, he decides to go against the grain. Benino comes in, picks the pocket. Goes out and then gets a goal short side. Was it glove side, I think? Uh, it was the short side. Uh, yeah, the glove. Yeah. Would you... Uh, did you have any notes about that little... Um, it's, just, it's just that that one little uh, mistake, you know. He trusts his gut. He goes with it one way. You don't ever not trust yourself to make the play. And I mean, it just backfired. So right, yeah, it did. It did seem like, you know, you want you want your players to have confidence in the actions that they're about to do, and he seemed really sure that he could get that puck over to Yoki Paka again. Which you know what, I guess you can't fault him on it. But there was a smarter play in just going up the boards. Hopefully, you know, it gets pointed out at a practice or a meeting to Jordy. Be like, look. That was too fancy. We need you to, you know, tone that down a little bit. Yeah. I think when when Jordy Ben tries to start being that fancy defenseman like the Goligoskis and Klingbergs that we have, that's when he's going to start making mistakes. And right. thankfully, starting the season, he has not had that mindset, yeah, I'd say, he, about 90% of the time. Yeah, it's been it's been a big surprise how well... Jordy has been playing, especially with last year. Every every game thread on Reddit, it would be like, "Look, we need Jordy." You know, scratched, benched, whatever. He should not be playing. Mm -hmm. And now, you know what? A lot of the time, he's not getting mentioned because he's out there doing his job, which which is great seeing. Did you have anything else that you wanted to throw out there? Any little um, observations? It's just it's nice to know that uh, 
our defense are sticking with their offensive defenseman type mentality with Klingberg, I'm pretty sure he, since he had the goal, and he definitely had a helper on the fourth one. It, it's glad to know that they're not completely losing that mindset and that their defense isn't suffering for it. Right. And to touch on Spez's goal, I think that epitomized his line they applied a lot of pressure and because they were applying that pressure like the stars didn't really seem to be letting up and it got Perron to just throw the puck back into the middle for Spezza to pick up and you know what I I don't think people talk a lot about Spezza's shot I think people underestimate his shot he's got a a whist a uh, oh, a twisted wrister that he can get off like no other. He's got an amazing shot. Um, some an observation that I had that maybe if a Pittsburgh Penguins fan is listening, I I went and asked I went and asked a friend that is a real big Pittsburgh Penguins fan, and I went and asked uh, this question on Reddit as well. When the game looks like it's escaping the Penguins. Does, does it not look like Malkin turns into like one of the biggest puck hogs there is? He he just seems to try to do everything himself. Whenever he, I, I understand that he wants to ignite the offense to try to get something going, but it's something that I noticed that he he doesn't pass. He doesn't look for anybody else on the ice. And I think that was a big downfall for Pittsburgh in the later parts of the game is that when Malkin was on the ice, he turned into a puck hog. He tried to do everything in themselves. If the coach doesn't address that, I think that's a serious oversight on Pittsburgh's. And I've noticed that for the past couple of seasons whenever I've been able to watch a Pittsburgh game here and there. Um, I asked some fans about that. They said he kind of does that only to ignite the offense of Pittsburgh. But I think that's a detriment to the roster. It it goes to show that they're not a well-coached team right now. And their team play is down. Something you don't really associate with Pittsburgh. But that, that was an observation. An observation. An observation. Hopefully, maybe some Pittsburgh fans will tell me I'm wrong, or they'll say I'm right. So, Dallas wins four to one. They sweep the East. They're off to a six and one start. Let's make or okay. Let's do our ratings. What do you rate? This game, what's your rating? I rate it an A. Okay. Just because that one mistake by Jordy Ben and the first period, which seems to be kind of a recurring theme for our team, which hopefully we can stop and get a little more hustle in the first ten minutes of the of the game instead of trying to play catch up. Because it seems like we're doing all of our all of our power. And getting all of our goals in the last ten minutes of the first period. Yeah. So if we can change that, I'm this team would be unstoppable. I agree. It does seem like Dallas is coming out and trying to get a feel for the game. I'd much rather them come out, set the tone, and then go from there. But you know what? If it's working, it's working. Hopefully they are, can turn the tide, start the attack, and go from there from now on. You know, I also rated the game an A. Killer defense, killer goaltending. And you know what? Ben Sagan held off the score sheet. Didn't matter. We had goals from defense, which is when you can get your defense to contribute in the scoring, you should not lose the game. Dallas didn't. They got looks from from everyone I gave I also rated it an A so with Dallas coming home after and going into a four game homestand 
what are your predictions for the Florida game? Um, I say that we keep it rolling and that we beat Florida. Score is probably going to be, I want to say, 3-2 to two for Dallas. And if we happen to fall short, I'm going to say Florida has has an explosive night and they're going to do 4-2. to two. Interesting, interesting. Um, I like... I like the thoughts of it staying close, but I only think it's close if Florida wins. I'm going to say if Florida wins, it's on three to two, but that's only because of last game we saw that they throw the body around. If they apply the pressure and they take Dallas's legs away by really sustaining the body, keeping pressure on, I think Florida wins three to two. Um, if Dallas wins, ooh, I'm going to say it's going to be a huge game, and I'm going to say the score is five to one if Dallas wins. So yeah, that's Dallas and Pittsburgh. As Razor would say, winners get sprinkles. And the Dallas's Cupcake is filled with sprinkles right now. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and we'll see you next time. Bye.